the White House in transition released two New Year statements. While outgoing President Trump reflected on what he called his historic victories, President-elect Biden looked to the future with plans for improvements such as distributing COVID vaccines more quickly. In working our way back to review Iran in 2020, America's historic victories come into play. Trump's accomplishments included frequently ignoring the severity of the pandemic and at times even ignoring the science behind virus transmission. Earlier in 2020, he presented Iran with a New Year gift, the lifeless body of its anti-Daesh general Soleimani. Soleimani was assassinated on the 3rd of January by a U.S. drone strike in Baghdad. And later in the year, towards the year end, Fakhrizadeh, an Iranian nuclear scientist, was assassinated. Stay with me, Leila Faramazi, on Iran today and running you through the year past. In between assassinations, Iran grappled and is still grappling with the coronavirus like the rest of the world. But whilst under the harshest ever sanctions imposed by the US. In attempting a chronological account of events, I begin with cause of the year's first assassination. Dr. Marandi is going to be accompanying us on this show, and you'll be seeing some of our show guests from past in reviewing 2020. I think the reasons for the murder of General Soleimani are quite obvious. The Americans were frustrated that they were defeated in Syria. They were supporting ISIS and Al-Qaeda, and uh, so were their allies and they were hoping to undermine Syria. We know that from the former U.S. Secretary of State, Kerry, when he said we allowed ISIS to advance on Damascus to put pressure on President Assad. Soleimani was martyred after Trump was impeached, but before his Senate trial. So it was partly a distraction from White House insufficiency and offense. Trump simply mulled over the decision over a round of golf, according to Bob Woodward, the journalist who authored Rage, a book on President Trump. Soleimani was plotting imminent and sinister attacks on American diplomats and military personnel, but we caught him in the act and terminated him. This was at a 9th January news conference, a day after the Iranian reaction to the assassination. But how realistic was Trump's explanation? No sooner had he spoken than his own Secretary of State Pompeo contradicted him, saying, there were a series of imminent attacks that were being plotted by Qasem Soleimani. We don't know precisely when, and we don't know precisely where. Apparently, that speculation was enough to slay the father and protect her against Daesh or ISIS, along with his company of nine, including a man who enjoyed similar reverence in Iraq, Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis. That was the deputy commander of the Hashta Shabi paramilitary umbrella group. So then we saw the Iraqi parliament uh, move to expel, to call on the United States to leave and, and end the occupation. And we saw the millions of people in Baghdad go to the streets demanding for the end of the U.S. occupation. And during the anniversary of the uh, assassination of General Soleimani and Abu Mahdi al mandis again, we saw huge crowds in Baghdad on the night of the terror attack, as well as uh, the, during the following day. So um, the, Iraqi, the response of the Iraqi people was very different from what we would be hearing from Western and pro-Western media outlets and think tanks and pundits. Soleimani wasn't exactly your run-of-the-mill IRGC commander. 
He had evolved socially as well as militarily, so it wasn't completely surprising to see women with partially covered hair among the millions of mourners, or for me to see a policeman quietly weeping as he kept an eye on the procession from above, on the pedestrian bridge where we were filming. Soleimani volunteered for the eight-year war of the 80s that Iraq imposed on Iran with generous help and encouragement from world powers. Over the U.S. strike on the Soleimani al Mohandis company, Iraq could not remain quiet either. And in the face of growing anger, the Iraqi parliament urged the government to oust the roughly 5,200 American troops stationed in Iraq. Based on conventions, when a country has military barracks in another country, even legally, but carries out military action in violation of their agreement, the latter's military presence will be deemed illegitimate. Then, the host nation can reverse the agreement and demand that they withdraw their troops. The U.S. assassination of General Qasem Soleimani in Iraq violated international conventions as well as bilateral agreements. What the U.S. did amounted to human rights violation. As for the Iranian reaction to the U.S. strike, ballistic missiles fired at Iraq's Ain al-Assad base where U.S. forces were stationed. America's inability to defend itself against the air attack or its unpreparedness was a great historical humiliation for that superpower that has made West Asia its business more than that of West Asian states themselves. After the assassination of General Soleimani, the Americans sent us messages through diplomatic channels and we responded to them. They also sent mediators who were making efforts so that the Americans decide the timing and the place of retaliation. One of these mediators said that President Trump was even ready to lift sanctions on Iran in return for no retaliation from Tehran. The Americans had no ballistic missile interceptors in range when on January the 8th, Iran fired 13 ballistic missiles into Iraq at bases housing American troops. 11 of which hit the Ain al-Assad base. It was a warning and no American or coalition partners were killed. On the same day, that's January the 8th, the Ukrainian passenger jet was shot down shortly after takeoff from Imam Khomeini airport off Tehran. All 176 people on board flight PS752 lost their lives. It must have been a natural consequence of expecting a U.S. reaction to the Ain al-Assad retaliation. Iran's military said it unintentionally downed the plane, mistaking it for a cruise missile as it turned towards a sensitive site belonging to Iran's IRGC. Ukraine International Airlines denied the plane veered from its expected course before the crash and said officials should have closed the airport. Canada's Foreign Minister Champon actually alleged he did not believe that the downing of the plane could be blamed on human error, whereas Iran implied there could have been no cover-up as Canada's representatives had visited the site of the crash and had participated in the reading of the plane's black box in Paris. The argument for Iran is pretty straightforward. The downing of the plane was just hours after Iran's retaliation to the Soleimani assassination. So Iran was expecting a possible reaction by the US. Well, the downing of the passenger plane was tragic, but I think it's very clear for any sane person and any fair-minded person that the real culprit is the United States. We have to remember that Trump threatened to destroy Iran. He threatened even to destroy Iran's cultural sites. So when the Iranians retaliated for the assassination of General Soleimani in Baghdad and they fired missiles at the occupation base in Iraq, the, where the American forces were based, the Al-Assad base, uh, the Iranians were expecting an American counter-strike, and the officer who shot down the plane, he made a very, very tragic mistake, and a very horrific mistake. But there is no doubt that if it wasn't for the American murder of General Soleimani, 
if it wasn't for the constant threats to destroy Iran by Trump, that this would never have happened. for a short break. We'll be back in no time. Iran is determined to neutralize U.S. hostility. Well, its parliament for one is. It was on February the 21st that elections for that new 11th parliament were held. And this is how results looked. 40 independents were elected, 19 reformists and moderates, and as many as 220 principalists. Voters opting for principalists was because they wanted a more decisive approach towards weak Western compliance with the JCPOA, the moderate government's pet project. There has been interesting activity in Parliament or the Islamic Consultative Assembly since which I will be referring to later in the program. Blocking the transfer of medicine, or the means to pay for it, that's oil money, or to transfer it, sanctions through and through. No, actually, you can call it genocide on the sly. Here's who's the culprit and who cares with corona on the loose. Blocks on medicine and or banking, so that Iran can't pay for drugs, raw materials and medical equipment. Culpability begins with the US, but the strain has carried on in Iran. This in spite of the fact that the United Nations Human Rights Commissioner called for the urgent revaluation re of sanctions against countries grappling with the global pandemic. Coronavirus disease, or COVID-19, was first reported from Wuhan in China on December the 31st, 2019. Iran confirmed its first cases on February the 19th, 2020. Those were two positive cases in Qom city. The disease spread rapidly to adjacent provinces and shortly thereafter to all 31 provinces. The Ministry of Health took action by seeing to the formation of the National Committee to Combat Corona. Iran was not alone in its suffering. West Asian economies contracted by an average of around 5% because lockdowns slowed down domestic economic activity and limited global demand. Pandemic-sensitive sectors such as tourism particularly suffered, as did oil prices. And unemployment and poverty that prevailed before 2020 worsened and is foreseen to worsen further in 2021. Most regional governments worked hard to manage the crisis, but carnage was unavoidable given limited fiscal space. Now, Iran has had U.S. sanctions, be they legal or not, to deal with on top of the pandemic. The country has grown resilient to sanctions that have been ongoing throughout its 40-plus year life of the revolution. But with a maximum pressure campaign, it's surviving by gasping for air. Let me describe the situation of some countries around Iran these days. Most of them don't have any equipment or device for detecting this virus. And unfortunately, I should say, many of these countries don't even have a healthcare system. They can't even specify the number of infected people. For example, the healthcare system in Pakistan and Iraq are much inferior to that of Iran. In Iran, there are many labs which try to test this virus and other viruses, and our healthcare system is able to check this virus and give report to the World Health Organization every day. U.S. restrictions on Iran's banking system and oil exports have limited this country's ability to finance and purchase essential items from abroad. That's drugs as well as raw materials and equipment needed to manufacture medicine domestically. Talking illegal, 
The Trump administration has even reduced the number of licenses it grants companies for certain medical exports to Iran. It is not possible to determine exactly how much U.S. sanctions have affected Iran's capacity to fight a virus, according to Iranian medical workers and global public health experts. It is clear, of course, that Iran has been deprived of equipment needed to control further infection and save lives. Iran has manufactured much, but surely its capacity to control the outbreak has been limited. The U.S. pulled out of the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or Iran nuclear deal in 2018. The deal that was supposed to lift sanctions off Iran in return for Iran limiting its peaceful nuclear program. Yet in 2020, America attempted a resolution to indefinitely extend the UN arms embargo on Iran. That would mean tampering with a provision of the JCPOA, which the US no longer had any business with. But for all its maximum pressure campaign against Iran, the US for once found itself receiving minimal support. The occasion was marked in mid-August as the UN Security Council resoundingly defeated the resolution, leaving Trump's America with support only from the Dominican Republic. In the 75 years of United Nations history, America has never been so isolated, the then Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesman Musavi tweeted. Despite all the pressure applied on Iran, it maintained its regional policy vis-à-vis -vis its Middle East and Anatolian neighbors with which it has normal ties. Owing to deep-seated ties with neighbors, the country was spared serious economic harm and the economic collapse the U.S. hoped to happen by 2019 did not happen. What is clear is that the Americans have failed in their pressure campaign to bring Iran to its knees. JCPOA signatory China said, should the U.S. insist, regardless of international opinion, it is doomed to fail like today. Unilateralism receives no support and bullying will fail. Germany, however, ended 2020 by saying outright it did not trust Iran. Now, what might that mean for the JCPOA and Iran's compliance with the deal? Its compliance and limiting nuclear activity, that is. No one in Iran cares for what anything the Germans have to say. What is important for Iran is the nuclear deal. If the Germans and Western countries want Iran to implement their side of the bargain, then they have to implement their side of the bargain. This is not an act of friendship. This is not a marriage. This is a deal. This is a deal that was negotiated over years. Both sides gave and both sides took. The Iranian government may have had to struggle with domestic corruption, but external problems alone have been many, beginning with the U.S. pullout from the JCPOA to mostly just verbal compliance by other Western parties to that deal, and all forms of sabotage by the U.S. and or Israel as assassinations and explosions of nuclear sites. Principalist parliamentarians submitted separate plans to Ghalibaf to withdraw from the JCPOA an additional protocol to the NPT, Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, that is, if it comes to it. Their resolve was intensified by the Natanz explosion and Fakhrizade assassination. Here's where I slip with the chronological. The explosion at Natanz uranium enrichment site was a major highlight of the year past. It was the result of sabotage and a tragedy. It caused major damage that would slow down the development of advanced uranium enrichment centrifuges. Natanz, much of which is underground, is one of several Iranian facilities monitored by the IAEA, the UN nuclear watchdog, which certified 15 times that Iran was in full compliance with the nuclear deal. That's till before Iran was pushed into mincing away from its commitments, however reversibly so. Fatality was inflicted not just on a nuclear site, but a nuclear scientist. 
the last of several nuclear personalities assassinated over the years. Mohsen Fakhrizade departed on the 27th of November 2020. Israel is not lightly suspected of the assassination, as it had marked the name Fakhrizade in addressing the world with accusations against Iran years back. No, I don't think the statement that the Israeli regime carried out the murder of General Fakhrizadeh, Dr. Fakhrizadeh, Professor Fakhrizadeh, I don't think that's speculation. It's pretty clear from Trump's retweets, from what senior American officials unnamed said to the New York Times, and from other material that has come out that the Israelis were involved. And ultimately, the Israeli regime will have to pay a price. But already the Americans are paying a price because parliament approved a law to expand Iran's nuclear program as a result of this murder and terrorist attack. In my opinion, there were two goals behind this assassination. It's a general goal that those seeking to restrict Iran's military industry have stepped in to turn their demands into an operational stage and thus assassinate the father of Iran's military industry. This has been a large-scale goal. The second goal was tactical. They seek to force Iran to make a rash reaction to this event. Basically, Mr. Trump is working with Israel to make Iran do something that would make it fundamentally important possible to return to the deal. With all that's come to pass, non or weak compliance with the JCPOA by Western parties to that deal, assassinations and sabotage, Parliament decided to put an end to a one-way game. Here's how. Iranian Parliament is resolute it will lift sanctions off Iran or ditch the deal. Its resolution is named Strategic Action to Lift Sanctions. The 1st of December saw MPs approve the outlines of that bill. This followed a phased reduction in Iran's commitments to the JCPOA given what President Rouhani called the E3's support for the constant intensification of cruel American sanctions against Tehran. Well, the Parliamentary Act was in response, partially, to the murder of Professor Fakhrizadeh, and it was a form of punishment. It was telling the United States that when you condone murder, when you give a green light to murder, this is the response that you get. But it is also sending a second message, and that is to Biden. And that is that if Biden wants to implement the nuclear deal, he can do it on day one. He can give presidential decrees and reverse everything that Trump has done within one day. His lawyers actually could be doing that right now. That was his intention. And the Iranians are saying, if you do not do so, that means you're buying time and you're playing games. And we are going to expand our nuclear program as a result. According to the nine article bill, the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran, AEOI, will be required to produce and store at least 120 kilograms of enriched uranium with 20% purity at the Fordow nuclear facility every year to fulfill the country's peaceful industrial demands. Also, the organization is to increase the monthly output of enriched uranium for various peaceful purposes with different purity levels by at least 500 kilograms. And it is to increase the number of centrifuge machines to a thousand within a year after the ratification of the bill. The bill also necessitates the inauguration of a metallic uranium factory in Isfahan within five months and restoration of a 40 megawatt heavy water reactor in Iraq, which was supposed to be redesigned and optimized under the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. The bill requires the government to prevent any foreign access and monitoring beyond the additional protocol and to suspend the voluntary implementation of the additional protocol to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, NPT, three months after the ratification of it. Once again, that is if the parties to the nuclear deal between Iran and world powers fail to uphold their obligations under the deal. 
The fact is that the impacts of the U.S. withdrawal from the JCPOA and the intensification of sanctions on the Iranian society are quite obvious. We no longer accept negotiating on anything other than the nuclear issue. It's very natural. The other side is not trustworthy and has always been so. That's all we've got on 2020 today. Thanks for watching. We will be back to cover events in the new year each week at the same time, so do tune in. We look forward to seeing you in 2021. Happy New Year.